Great, well, um, Dave's already introduced me. Um, I'm also Dave. Um, <laughs> similarities don't stop there. We uh, both study physics and got physics degrees. We trained to be teachers together uh, in Oxford. We went to the same job interview uh, and they created a second job to employ us both. So we talked alongside each other in a secondary school in Oxford as well. Um, but hopefully, hopefully the, the similarities stop there. <laughs> um, I'd love to uh, share a word from Acts uh, with you today. Um, it's a word that I preached in, in Oxford in April. Um, and having finished it, I kind of thought, I hope this isn't the last time um, that I get to preach this message. And in, in praying uh, ahead of time about what to share, I felt uh, God just sort of put this on my heart for you guys in the church. So, and my hope is that it serves you today. It's not just um, educational, but that uh, um, as, as I share, you know, God speaks to you as a, a young church as well. Um, but before I can sort of get into it, they told me that um, the church in Sheffield is full of really bold, courageous people. Was he right? Yeah. <laughs> Was he right? Yeah. <laughs> he, said, he said, Dave, you're not going to get the Emmanuel Oxford death stare that we just so enjoy. Uh, where you're just wondering if everyone hates you because they're thinking so deeply. Um, so two things. Firstly, like in Oxford, I've been trying really hard, starting with the students who are more winnable, um, to get a little bit back um, when we're preaching. So I've been encouraging them to say things like, so good. Uh, uh, can you practice that? Great point, Dave. Glory. Okay, you were less certain about that one. But, uh, it'll be a deep encouragement to me, and you might find that your faith is stirring as you sort of engage a bit more um, as, as I'm talking. Um, but the other thing um, is that I've got a scripture to read today that I'm determined not to read myself, so I need five volunteers um, that are prepared to come up and um, read it off the screen. Uh, using the mic. Um, it's five slides, uh, five volunteers. So who's going to be first to their feet? Uh, it's an NLT translation, not the ESV, so uh, it makes it easier. I can promise you there's only two names you might not recognise. The main one and Thaddeus, and neither of those are complicated. So can I, can I have five volunteers? Just come up and queue along here, um, and the scripture will be on the screen, so please turn it here. One, it only takes one. It only takes one. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So you read that, and I think the first slide has the most text on it. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 the high priest and his officials, who were Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But an angel of the Lord came at night, opened the gates of the jail, and brought them out. Then he told them, Go to the temple and give the people this message of life. So at daybreak, the apostles entered the temple, as they were told, and immediately began teaching. When the high priest and his officials arrived, they convened the high council, the full assembly of the elders of Israel. Then they sent for the apostles to be brought from the jail for trial. But when the temple guards went to the jail, the men were gone. So they returned to the council and reported, the jail was securely locked with the guards standing outside, but when we opened the gates, no one was there. <laughs> when the captain of the temple guard and the leading priests heard this, they were perplexed, wondering where it would all end. Then someone arrived with startling news. The men you put in jail are standing in the temple, teaching the people. The captain went with, with his temple guard and arrested the apostles, the apostles, but without violence, for they were afraid the people would stone them. Then they brought the apostles before the high council, where the high priest confronted them. We gave you strict orders never again to teach in this man's name, he said. Instead, you have filled all Jerusalem with your teaching about him, and you want to make us responsible for his death. Peter and the apostles replied, We must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead after you killed him by hanging him on the cross. Then God put him in a place of honour at his right hand as Prince and Saviour. He did this so the people of Israel would repent of their sins and be forgiven. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, who is given by God to those who obey him. 
When they heard this, the high council was furious and decided to kill him. But one member, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, who <laughs> <laughs> was an expert in religious law and respected by all the people, stood up and ordered that the men be sent outside the council chamber for a while. <laughs> Then he said to his colleagues, Men of Israel, take care what you are planning to do to these men. Some time ago, there was that fellow, Bruce, who pretended to be someone great. About 400 joined, others joined him, but he was killed, and all his followers went their various ways. The whole movement came to nothing. After him, at the time of the census, there was Judas of Galilee. He got people to follow him, but he was killed too, and all his followers were scattered. So, my advice is, leave these men alone. Let them go. If they are planning and doing these things merely on their own, it will soon be overthrown. But if it is from God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You may even find yourselves fighting against God. The others accepted his advice. They called in the apostles and had them flogged. Then they ordered them never again to speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go, let them go. The apostles left the high council, rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. And every day in the temple and from house to house they continued to teach and preach this message. Jesus is the Messiah. Right. We give everyone a round of applause. <laughs> Um, I don't know how much you guys know about Luke, um, the author of Acts, but he was a meticulous historian. He says this about himself um, in the introduction to his gospel. He says, I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning. I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of things that have been taught. And uh, it paints this sort of autobiographical picture of interviewing people, co collecting and comparing accounts and trying to form something um, that was really deliberately uh, arranged to help uh, his original uh, listeners, but also then us, uh, to make sense of the person of Jesus. And um, so I hope what we understand from Luke is that nothing's there by accident, but all of it has been, has been put um, deliberately. And so I just want to sort of go slightly wider than this passage, it's just a bit two ways that Luke has framed um, our passage today. And it really helps us to understand like, what, what is this passage about? Um, and the first of those is um, what I've called the Luke's triple threat. Okay, and it's not that he can dance, act, and sing, um, but it's, it's, it's a moment of stories, uh, all of which illustrate threat to the original church. So immediately beforehand, um, we've got Ananias and Sophia, and that's the, the threat to the church of indwelling sin. You may know the story, you may not. Um, immediately afterwards, you have the dispute between the Greeks and the Hellenists about the distribution of foods to the widows. Um, and that's the thread of disunity in between the church. And uh, right in the middle of it, we have our passage today, in which we see the apostles are imprisoned. And it's like this is a, the external thread of opposition towards the church. And I want you to think about that for a minute. Like all 12 apostles imprisoned in a single place. Like, imagine the threat to this fledgling early church in Jerusalem, but all 12 of these people that Jesus had commissioned and sent to take his, his ministry to the world who were imprisoned in a single place. Like Luke's using these two threats of, uh, kind of internal threats to frame the story we're looking at today and saying this is a big deal, this is a, a massive external threat to the church. The second bit of framing, we're just going to go all the way back for, from Acts 1 through to Acts 7. And, and I've called it escalation. Um, so let's look briefly about escalation in Acts. Okay, Acts 2, uh, you have Pentecost. Um, Holy Spirit comes and says 3,000 were added to their number. Acts 3, we hear the story of the healing of the lame beggar. And it says many of those who heard the word believed, and the number came to about 5,000. Acts 5. It says many signs and wonders. You see, the escalation were regularly done among the people. More than ever, believers were added to the Lord's multitudes of men and women. And we're reading this story from Acts 1 through to Acts 5 and beyond of escalation in the advance of the gospel. 
But let's look at a second escalation. Acts 4, Peter and John were arrested and put in jail. They were told off, they charged them not to teach or speak about Jesus, and it says they were threatened further. Acts 5, all the apostles were arrested and put in jail, and they weren't just warned, they were flogged as well. And so we can see this story of escalation that carries through into Acts 7, where Stephen did greater signs and wonders, and then ultimately was killed. And it teaches us this, it teaches us that as there's escalation in advance of the gospel, there's escalation in the pushback in terms of opposition, opposition to it. It's like Newton's third law of spiritual motion. And I have a greater the advance of the gospel, but greater the pushback of opposition against it. And you may have noticed as I was reading in this passage, it uses the word filled twice. And it means like filled to, to the very top. It says, the apostles, verse 28, were filled Jerusalem with their teaching. It's like the teaching concerning Jesus is full to the brim. And then it says also that the Sadducees were filled with jealousy in verse 17. Like this is a, a moment sort of pregnant with what's going to happen next. So, so why should this passage catch our attention? Why is this passage relevant for Emmanuel Church Sheffield? Well, you guys are, are pioneering and planting a new church in Sheffield. You're advancing the kingdom of God into, in, in ways and in areas where it hasn't been advanced before. Dave tells me that uh, as a church, you're really beginning to get to grips with what it means to share your faith with those around you. Um, he said that he reckons every week at least one person in the church is sharing the gospel actively um, with their friends, with their colleagues, or in their spheres of influence. And you're developing like a gospel community that's laying the roots and it's going to endure far beyond the length of time that many of you might end up being here. And so we recognise that there's an escalation in the advance of the gospel, there's also an escalation in the pushback and opposition that we face from it. And you've already seen it, haven't you? You know, Dave's experience of hospitalisation, of illness. You know, like when we're fasting and praying in Oxford, us and other churches as well, and you guys fasting and praying in Sheffield, and we're praying against opposition. We're praying for God to break through and win battles. And I'm sure it's not just that. I'm sure many of you have faced, like, disproportionate or gratuitous personal challenges it just seem above and beyond. It seemed to be pressures from many directions that you face as you've been involved in planting this church. And so I'm hoping that by looking at this passage, I hope it serves you and brings you courage for this next season. And we're going to do two things. Number one, we're going to look at how did the apostles respond in the face of opposition. And we're going to make three observations about that. And then secondly, we're going to ask the question, well, what is this teaching they fill the city with? So first of all, how did the apostles respond in face of opposition? The, the first thing that we can observe is this, they had an expectation of it. Verse 17 says this, But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is, the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. Was it a surprise to the apostles? No. <laughs> no, it wasn't. For, for three years, they had an apprenticeship in opposition as they walked alongside Jesus. As he was opposed by crowds, some of whom tried to kill him, Luke 4, John 8. As he was opposed by religious leaders who tried to trick him and pick fights or arrest him. And even as he was opposed by his own family who tried to dissuade him. They had three years of apprenticeship in opposition. And, and also, they had teaching on it. Jesus taught them they should expect opposition as well. Matthew 10 16 says this I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves, as Jesus is talking. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. Like, it was fundamental to their discipleship of Jesus this expectation of facing opposition. And it was something 
they were prepared for. Um, we've got a picture coming up, but I just want to kind of share an image to, to help us understand this and, and land it for ourselves. Um, and, and that is it's a simple kind of sentence, like we're born onto a battleship, not a cruise ship. As we choose to follow Jesus, like we, we, we're born onto a battleship and all the expectations that come with that, not onto a cruise ship. You know, just if, if we think follow, following Jesus, Jesus is like going on a cruise, you know, partly you're going to be really disappointed, but you have the expectation it's going to be all about a heated pool, uh, cocktails, convenience, and what works for me? How's this going to enrich my life? How's it going to make me more comfortable? And how am I going to enjoy things more as, an example, as a result of this? But actually, uh, the, the Gospels and teachers that. It teaches us that we're born onto a battleship. It teaches us that our expectation is that we're, we're entering a war. That's how Jesus paints it, it's how Paul writes it. It, it leads us to an expectation there's an enemy that's there to oppose us. And it teaches us we must be alert, we must be ready for what's going to come as well. So what's it really look like for us to, to live with an expectation of opposition? I don't know if you guys might remember the, the teaching Jesus gave, he said this, he said, I have come that you may have life, and life in all its abundance. How many of you know that verse, that teaching of Jesus for Some of us. It's beautiful, isn't it? Like, many of us love it, we preach it. You know, everything's glorious. He's come that we may have life to the full. Hallelujah. Now, how many of you remember the verse that precedes it? Or well, the first part, I think it's the same verse. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. I mean, here's the point, the, the abundant life that Jesus promises to lead us into, full of his spirit, full of fruit, comes within the context of a thief that is there to seek, uh, kill, and destroy. So it means this, it means we re reject a prosperity theology. My life with Jesus is nothing but thriving. Jesus is in the house, everything's on an upward curve for your individual flourishing. And it means we reject a material theology. Like there's, there's no enemy. Like all these obstacles, all these oppositions, they're just circumstances that I happen to be facing. But it means we accept a Jesus theology. There's a thief that will use any means to rob us of the abundance of life that Jesus is leading us into. Temptation, sin, poor health, distraction, multiplying pressures from many directions. The abundant life that Jesus promises us to lead us into, full of his spirit, full of fruit, full of adventure, comes in the context of a thief that seeks to kill still and destroy. And here's the point, right? You know, coming back to the battleship and the cruise ship, like when a torpedo lands on the deck, if you've got a theology that puts you on a cruise ship, it's going to come as such a surprise. Like, this isn't what I signed up for. What's going on? Are like, you going to be banging on the captain's door saying this isn't right? But if you understand that you're on a battleship, when the torpedo lands on the deck, you're trained, you're ready, and it's just a case of battle stations. Having an expectation of opposition helps us be prepared to face it when it arrives. Here's the second point that the disciples show us. It's obedience. Let's listen to verse 19 to 21. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to preach. I love even the escalation of the gospel in this passage. They were preaching in Solomon's portico, like a little sort of, you know, round the sides, square. The angel says, go and preach in the temple. Go to the central place of Jewish worship and teach there. What didn't they do? They didn't delay. Let's lay low and narrow escape. Let's go to the temple once things have calmed down. They didn't divert. Our temple's pretty busy. I won't go to the fish gate first. And they didn't discourage. 
perhaps risk it. I'm not sure it's a great idea. Have you seen the temple guards recently? They're looking hench. <laughs> uh, they didn't diminish. Uh, maybe we should just speak to some people. Uh, maybe we should look for sympathetic people, or even our people. Uh, maybe we should share some of the words, maybe the ones that won't get us into trouble. But what they did do was instant obedience. Scripture says at daybreak, and literally the first opportunity they had, they entered the temple and they began to teach. What's it mean for us to live in obedience in the face of opposition? I think for all of us, there's a temptation where when we face the external pressure of opposition to aim for less, to sort of retract and withdraw into ourselves, to delay, to divert, to discourage, to diminish. And this is the point at which I need my glamorous assistance. <laughs> um, so if you could just grab the props. Um, and the picture might serve us as well. Um, the picture is, is what I hope to have, um, but sadly my prop department let me down and so we've got a, a one week old balloon and a cereal box. Um, but but if, if we do this, if, we, if, we, if our response to opposition is to aim for less, to retract, to withdraw, uh, what happens is we're a little bit like the paper balloon. So let's start with this one. And, uh, <laughs> At least both of us look silly now. <laughs> yeah. um, but if we listen to these voices, if we listen to the external pressure of opposition, like it feeds us many lies, doesn't it? You know, you should think about yourself for a bit. Like, don't, don't worry, someone else will do it. I think it's past you by. You couldn't do that. It's not really that important. Like, as we do that, our uh, external pressures make our world get smaller and smaller and smaller. And as our world retracts and withdraws and gets smaller and smaller and smaller, we find ourselves aiming for less and less. Less purpose, less faith, less hope. Like what started off as feeling like self-preservation or even self-care can end up feeling oppressive and heavy and hopeless. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Well done, Bev. Okay, I did, I must admit, I did think about what if I put something really strong inside a box so that you sit there and couldn't actually crush it. But, um, so you, you can do away with that one. So we've got a picture of what it does look like um, to, to walk in obedience in the face of opposition. It's a little bit, you haven't got sharp nails, have you? Good. Um, it's a little bit more like a balloon. You know, when the external pressures come, when they're, they're not without impact, like as Dave squeezes the balloon, you can see that it, it causes stress and strain, it causes discomfort. You know, it may change the shape of our world as well, but what you notice is that the world stays as large as it was before. You know, our faith, our hope, our engagement in God's purposes stay as big as they were before, and, and it squeezes it in one area, what you might even find is it pops up and gets bigger in another, as God leads us into other areas of abundance that we weren't walking in before. Thank you, David, for that one. And the, the disciples demonstrate this to us beautifully. Like there's an immediate obedience in the face of opposition, and as they embrace this immediate uh, obedience, their worlds remain as large as before, and their faith, hope, and joy in the purposes of God keep on growing. Amen? Amen. 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 The third thing we observe is this, like they rejoice. Verse 39, they took his advice, and when they called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and then let them go. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonour for his name. They left rejoicing. And why were they rejoicing? Rejoicing in the fruit? Jerusalem's filled with the teaching. No. Rejoicing then release. Out again. I they don't have anything on us. I know they rejoice, it says, in the beating. They were counted worthy to suffer dishonour for the name. What's it mean to rejoice? 
in the face of opposition. Here's the best analogy that I can think of. How many of you run? How many runners here today? A handful of people. Hands are really low. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to be ashamed of. Like, in Oxford, people go like this. Yeah, I'm a runner. <laughs> um, but like, it's, it's like this. It's like going for a run in the rain. You know, running as hard as it is. I, I don't run. I'm not even sure I jog. Like, maybe I trudge. Sometimes it just feels like I haul myself around the streets of East Oxford. But adding wind, adding rain, like the horribleness of the experience just grows and grows, you know. Like, but as you persist, as you refuse to yield, as you run through the rain, like, what happens is a smile creeps over your face. Like, there's this inward exhilaration. Like, there's a feeling of having conquered like, both yourself and the situation. There's a joy that comes having persevered in the face of opposition. And Christian joy is its greatest when we're most aligned with God's purposes. And when the decision we take is, I'm going to obey God, even though it's costing me, it produces a rejoicing in obedience that then can't be shaken by circumstance. So there's three observations how the apostles help us to learn to uh, kind of uh, face opposition when it comes. Firstly, expectation. Um, secondly, obedience. And then thirdly, rejoicing. Um, I said at the beginning we'd do this, we'd, we'd, we'd look secondly at what is this teaching that they filled the city with, because that's got to be a central importance as we look at this passage. There's a challenge, isn't there? They filled the city. Uh, let's not just move past that, let's fill the challenge. What does it look like to fill Sheffield with the Gospel? What's it look like to fill your friendship groups, your workplaces, your campuses, your colleges? There's a side point. Let's look at what are the words of life the angel commanded them to speak. Verse 27, and with a little break, we're going to continue on to 32. And when the high priest questioned them, saying, we strictly charge you not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon you. The high priest is questioning them, and but I just want to let you know, my answer would be very different to Peter's. Okay? Because my answer to every question would be the angel. We strictly told you to, uh, Sorry, sorry, you missed a question. You forgot to ask, how did I get out of the prison? The angel let me out. No, no, no. We strictly told you not to teach in his name. Hold on a second, wait, stop, stop. The, the angel told me to teach. Like, my answer to everything would be the angel, the angel, the angel. But Peter's answer to every question is this Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. So listen to what he said. He said, We must obey God rather than man. The God of our fathers raised Jesus whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. And God exalted Jesus at his right hand as leader and saviour to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness for sins. And we are witnesses to Jesus. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. What is the teaching of the apostles filled Jerusalem with? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Uh, the name that the religious leaders wouldn't even speak in private is the name that the apostles can't stop shouting in public. And they say this, they say, we, we watched him die, we've seen him raised, we're the witnesses and how God's exalted him as leader and saviour. Amen? I think this word leader caught my attention because it's not a word you see in the Bible often. Um, when I was studying this text, it's the Greek word archidos. Like it, it's translated in the NLT as prince, um, has that meaning, it's, it has the meaning of author, and um, also it can get translated leader. It's the same three words, you may, may be familiar from the Hebrews, the author of salvation. Um, but if you start looking in more detail, the first half is arxe, which means first. 
And the second part is ago, which means to lead. So, so to explore and see how this word is used in other contemporary Greek contexts, it's this. It's the first in a procession. It's like the final leader who pioneers a way that many others can follow behind. Um, how many of you have ever taken part in a procession? No, hands really are low for that. <laughs> One of you, you're not a very processive church, as it, as it happens, but um, I'm going to tell you about uh, the time that I took part in a procession. Um, and I'll do so with a little bit of pain, because um, I'm not a processive person either, but I think it's a helpful analogy for you. I went to a wedding, um, it's like no other wedding I've been to before or will ever go to again. It was in Kew Gardens, um, it was uh, from uh, someone who was part of the music industry in London. There were 400 guests, they used three greenhouses. And um, uh, Amy was also a bridesmaid, I was a proper plus one. So uh, I met a bride twice and a groom once, um, but was there essentially not knowing anyone else, which is, uh, I told you at the beginning I was a physicist, didn't I? So you can imagine the worst nightmare already. <laughs> um, but what happened is after the service, which was lovely, we, we went outside and um, it was a bit of an odd sight, really, because there was a man there, and there was a man with a top hat and um, a baton, you lead a procession with, and pink gloves. Um, I thought this already makes me feel very uncomfortable. Um, and to make matters worse, Amy got taken away in a horse-drawn carriage, and so I was left by myself uh, amongst 400 people and some very suspicious people um, at the front. And what it turned out to be was a procession from the wedding venue to the reception venue, across Kew Gardens, uh, with members of the public in every direction watching on. Um, and there should be a picture of the procession as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I know what you think, like, in some ways it doesn't look like a procession, it just looks like a number of people standing around. And um, that's because it's quite hard to take a picture of a procession when you're in the front in the procession yourself. And I know what you're thinking, it doesn't look like 400 people. Um, and that's because I was at the very front of the procession, just behind the bad bands, which is, was bad news. Um, and I know what you're thinking as well, if you look carefully, you can see that there are people with instruments at the front. And uh, where, where it got really bad is that uh, people started to dance. <laughs> I'm in this procession, there's 400 people, most of them behind me so they can see me. There's members of the public in every direction looking on and everyone is dancing apart from they like. <laughs> and I came to this horrific kind of conclusion that I was more conspicuous not dancing <laughs> than I was dancing. And so as I'm looking around, sort of walking around, you sort of think, oh, I've, I've somehow, I've, I've got, I've got, but it's, it's like internally, it's just causing me all sorts of pain, but it's the lesser of two evils. So, so why am I sharing what is genuinely a traumatic experience with you? It's because I think in some ways it's a helpful picture to understand the teaching that the disciples were sharing. Because the head of the procession, pink gloves, top hammer baton, there's a leader. But he gathered us into the procession. He set the direction of travel. He was determining the, the, the rhythm of our movements and he was setting our destination, which was a wedding feast. And everyone in the procession was looking to the leader. And Peter's saying, like, this is it. He's saying, here's the picture of this way of life. He's saying, it's a procession. He said, God's exalted Jesus at the right hand of God as the head of the procession. It's like he's the first, he's the one at the front, he's the innocent, perfect God man who defeated death on the cross, who's been raised to life, and who's created a pathway through which we can follow. And as we step into his procession, and we raise our eyes and we look to the head of the procession, he gives us, it says, repentance. As we turn from the path we're on and walk in a new direction following him. He gives us forgiveness of sins. He removes our guilt. He brings freedom from shame, freedom to live a life that's pleasing to him. He sets a new direction of travel, determining the rhythm of our movement. And he leads us to a destination, to a wedding feast to look forward to 
in the future. And this is the teaching that is turning Jerusalem upside down. And that's what I tell you, this, this gospel has as much power to transform lives today as it did 2,000 years ago. And at the end, uh, we're going to have an opportunity to respond to this gospel, to look afresh at Jesus. You know, this person who got into the ring with death, who got knocked out, like, and as the, as the count starts, one, two, three, like, he stands up, he's back from the dead, and he defeats like the greatest enemy of mankind once and for all through his resurrection. Where he's made a way through death into new life that we can step into and follow him on a procession towards a transformed future. For many of us that are already in this procession, I wonder how many feel the pain or the dull ache of oppression. How many of us recognise external pressures that are pushing in and encroaching upon us? How many of us feel more like the box than the balloon? Like life has been compressed, like we're aiming for less, we've retracted. And it feels a little bit like a shadow of the Christian life we were hoping to lead. I think that this teaching offers us a real simplicity in response. And let's imagine what Peter's advice might be to us. Like Peter, how do you, how do you expect opposition? I looked at the head of the procession. He told me to expect it. Like Peter, how do you walk in obedience through oppression? Do you, do you know what? Like there was a time I failed. I disowned him three times in the face of opposition. I felt awful. And my life collapsed. I went back to fishing. I lost purpose. There was no joy. And do you know what? He came and he found me. He gives repentance and forgiveness. He always said to, to Peter, feed my lambs. I said, no, oh my God, it's too much. He said, Peter, feed my lambs. I said, no, but it's, it's too much. He said, Peter, I said, not three. Three's not a good number for me. He said, Peter, feed my lambs. Oh, it's, it's easy, I must obey God, not man. And he gives the Holy Spirit to those who obey him. I just look to the head of the procession. And Peter, how do you rejoice? In oppression. You know, it's, it's harder to explain. But all I know is I don't have to try. I just look to the head of the procession. I make this spontaneous smile. My, my heart beats faster and faster. I see the one who, for the joy sent before him, endured the cross, despising and shame. And my, my heart rejoices knowing that I have been faithful to him. I just look to the head of the procession. Why don't we stand together? and just have a moment of response. I said a minute ago, there's, there's a moment to respond, like to this person, Jesus, because the invitation is new every day, to turn from the path we're walking on and to join the procession that he leads us on through death and into new life and transformation. Well, if, that's a, if that's a journey that you want to take today, if you want to say yes to Jesus, the one who carves his path and turns around and beckons us to follow him, then I'm going to pray. And you can pray with me. Uh, 